Good afternoon and welcome to The Contrarians, a new political program on Sky News that will run each Friday during parliamentary sitting weeks. I'm Peter Van Onselen, your host, and joining me today we have two panellists, Bruce Maher, former Labor Party advisor, now communications expert, and Philip Senior, co-author of Howard's End and a business consultant. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us. Afternoon, Peter. Bruce, I'll start with you. Uh, is Labor playing politics with this whole ETS issue? Uh, well, the answer is not only politics, but obviously there's a lot of politics involved. I, I think the important thing to understand in, in any of these really big contentious issues, um, ones where there are ideological splits, but also major sort of national uh, issues of importance, politicians are essentially bipolar. Um, they do care about the policy um, and, uh, and they have genuinely held positions. I, I don't doubt for an instant that the National Party is sincere in its stated position or the Greens. Um, and it's obvious that the government, um, they're, they're sceptics, so they're not sceptics, they, they believe that climate change is uh, absolutely critical. They seem to be spending most of their time making sure that they're wedging the Liberal Party, don't they, on this particular issue? Well, I think having gone through a, a process of developing the policy um, and done some negotiation and with a lot of people, a lot of different interests, mm. they've got um, a position and yes, it's a compromise, but they, but they genuinely believe it's the best thing that they're going to get. And it has the added benefit that it's causing havoc in the Liberal Party and, um, and, and between the Liberals and the Nationals. And, uh, you know, that, bingo at that point, you know, it's, well, it's exactly it's, what you want. It's definitely causing havoc in the Liberal Party. I mean, if I can throw to you, Philip, this frontier scheme, the frontier economic scheme that Malcolm Turnbull put up just days before the legislation went in, is this a credible alternative when he doesn't have party support for it? Well, I think there's a couple of points to make about that. It, to be fair about when it was put up, this is a process that the Coalition started some time ago. Um, as I think we would all recognise, they've been, been calling on the government to do the kind of modelling of alternative schemes that Frontier has done for some time. Um, and the government was not forthcoming in that respect, so the Coalition has taken it upon themselves to do it. In terms of whether it's credible because the party might have some divisions over it, I think it's important to recognise that the party room's never going to 100% every member agree on an issue, but it is becoming clear that what uh, Malcolm Turnbull is doing is building majority support for an ETS, as long as that ETS is one that is going to deliver significant emission reductions, but at the lowest cost abatement. And that's what the Frontier model highlights, that the government's ETS isn't necessarily doing. I think, I think, the, I think there's a the problem in what they've done, though. I, I agree that it was useful in the short term. It gave them something that everybody could talk about. Um, and whereas previously they didn't really have a script, and that was that was good for this week, but in the long, well, first of all, it gave the the government the opportunity to say, well, what's your negotiating? You, you say you want to negotiate. Well, is it the nine principles? Mm. Is it the national party position? Is it this new frontier thing? And in the end, I mean, this is a negotiation, and the government will play hardball the way most people in a lot of people in negotiations play, and the terms of the discussion are going to be around the government scheme, and and I don't think that, uh, short of actually rejecting the thing outright, which we can, we can come to whether that's wise or not, um, Turnbull will have to move some way towards the government. The government will probably offer him a few things um, at the end, but what he won't get is the frontier option, and that leaves him exposed to those people who say, well, but you said this was the answer, and now you've conceded the, the government. The government point. needs to make sure, though, doesn't it, that it does move a little, because it, it was dangerously close this week to looking belligerent, refusing to deal with any alternatives. Admittedly, they had the benefit of arguing that the, the opposition were a bit all over the place on this, but over time, they're going to need to negotiate, aren't they? They can't stand by and, and refuse to do any negotiations in three months' time like they did this week. I, I think that's right, and I think it's, they're playing... the sort of classic negotiating game. You, you play hardball until you get to the point where, you know, there's, uh, there's a possibility of a compromise from the other mm. side. Because at the moment, um, you know, the coalition didn't really need to compromise either. I mean, they could still play this game and you end up uh, actually negotiating against yourself. And Philip, could I just ask yep. you for a moment, mm. if, if Labor does provide a, a willingness to negotiate and put forward some amendments, where does that leave the Liberal Party and Malcolm Turnbull when they've also got this whole frontier scheme? Mm. Do they go to that or do they say, no, we've got an entirely new sure. proposal that we want to push for? Sure, I think that there's a couple of points there. One is that uh, it depends what those uh, amendments that the government would be willing to move towards are. Because, for instance, one thing that has become apparent from the frontier uh, scheme and also from the US uh, Waxman-Markey legislation is that there is this glaring difference in the way the government is treating the agriculture sector that the coalition has a real problem with and wants to see change. So, for instance, I could imagine unless there is a significant change on that, it would be difficult for the coalition to get behind that scheme. Um, 
In terms of whether they need to support the frontier scheme itself and, and where does it leave them if they end up in a different position to that, I, I don't think that is a problem in itself. To be fair to the coalition, they have said from the moment this uh, report was given that it wasn't coalition policy. The point of commissioning... But that's the problem, isn't it? That, it, that it isn't coalition policy. I mean, there's, there's two things here. There's whether the policy is good or not. And mm. There seems to be some fairly favourable comment around it, but some criticism. But the big issue, like it or not, for the Liberal mm. Party is the optics of it, the PR campaign. And as long as it's not coalition policy, like it or not, journalists and the opposition are going to be, and the government rather, are going to be roundly criticising. I, I think that's true, but if you think about the dynamics of the last week and what was always going to happen, it was it was always going to be the case, given that we all knew what the government's legislation was and what they were proposing to pass, the focus was always going to be on the opposition, whether they would be able to go along with it, whether they choose to vote it down, mm. whether Malcolm Turnbull could keep it running in the tent, and that was always where the media spotlight was going to be. That was inevitable. What I think the coalition was able to do by having this report come out was that they were able to say, well, there's actually a substantive debate that we should be having, rather than just does everyone in the coalition party room agree, we should be having a debate around does this scheme adequately address the agriculture sector? Does this scheme adequately address electricity Bruce, can generators? I ask you, is now the time to have this debate? Well, I, th I think the, the, the point, which goes back, to, I suppose, to, a little bit to the point I made before about you know, negotiating tactics, I think the, the coalition is in a similar sort of thing. It's, this is a longer game, and, and, and the real, um, real argy-bargy happens uh, when it comes back in three months' time. Uh, that's where the stakes are you know, at their highest and everybody actually has to come to some position. And I think then you really get down to the question that the coalition will have to answer is, um, are they willing to, um, to compromise? Um, are they, do they accept that so much of middle Australia believes that this is the right thing to do, that it's necessary, that they're going to, um, to make, hopefully, that they, from their point of view, get some concessions? Mm. Or do they hold out because they see some political advantage um, in uh, maintaining the faith with the agriculture sector, for example. They see some potential to peel away some, some traditional Labor voters, uh, particularly in those sort of mining areas, and they may be the, the old Howard tactic of trying to sort of go around the Labor Party um, to its sort of more, if you like, uh, right-wing working-class constituency. So there are those sorts of um, factors that will come into mm. play. My view is that they will compromise mm. and that the government will give them enough they may not get the uh, the Nats, they may lose a few libs along the way, but the Turnbull will get them across the line and we won't get a... Phil, do you agree with that? Do you think that Turnbull's going to be able to move his party room to support an amended ETS in three months' time? I think, I think he is. I think Bruce is right on this because ultimately, if you think about the politics of this, I don't think either, either major party benefits from us having no ETS. The Liberals need it to be passed, ultimately, and Labor clearly needs it to be passed, given how much of a priority they've made it. So ultimately, I think we will get a scheme. The question is when we will get it, and the question is how much movement there will be from the model that's on the table today. And I, I agree with Bruce that, that the, the, there is politics uh, in terms of particular parts of the country that make the nature of the amendments that ultimately get made quite important politically, so particularly as they impact agriculture and, and coal-fired uh, coal power stations. And, 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 and back to your earlier point, there is a point at which the government looks completely intransigent mm. if it doesn't give some concessions um, and that will play, play against it politically, I'm sure. See, the, the other issue for me, and I haven't really seen much said about this, but it strikes me as wholly ironic that here's Kevin Rudd, the man that's written no less than 6,500 words a couple of times now, talking <laughs> about market fundamentalism being the scourge of the world, yet he is now putting his faith in an ETS which is entirely based on a market mechanism approach. How does Labor reconcile that? Well, I, I look, I think that that everyone is more complex in their in their real positions than, than sometimes you know you make This is the contrarians. What do you mean by conflict? <laughs> well, he's taking so he made he was making a series of political points um, in that essay, which were appropriate um, for the circumstances and the the broader um, uh, you know uh, global economic crisis and all those sorts of things. But when it comes down to it, you know governments have to deal with practical realities. They have to deal with um, with uh, economics. Uh, they have to deal with markets. He knows that. He's a pragmatist. Mm. He understands it. And you know, and Labor governments have done that um, over the years, even where they've had percep perceived ideological positions that don't sit comfortably with that. Philip, you're an economist, honours, first class, all the rest of it. Did you get much out of Kevin Rudd's monthly essay? Not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> what I did get is that uh, Kevin Rudd's a political chameleon, uh, but I think we probably already knew that uh, mm. if we watched 
the essays he'd written for the monthly in the lead up to assuming the Labor leadership and then gradually how he morphed into uh, an economic conservative in the lead up to the election. I think we already knew that. What the monthly, uh, the more recent uh, monthly essay and then the essay in Fairfax highlighted is just how brazen he's prepared to be about uh, moving his political positions as the, uh, as the environment requires. The other big issue of the week uh, was the Senate Privileges Committee. Uh, that was passed, that was successful. We now have a Senate Privileges Committee. Can I just ask, Bruce, you used to work for a Labor senator. Mm -hmm. What is a Senate Privileges Committee? Yeah, it's a very weird beast. Um, it's not like most of the other committees that exist uh, in the in the Senate. Uh, it tends to be much less partisan in the way it operates. Uh, it, it, it exists to uh, protect the dignity of the Senate, but also to make sure that the Senate can operate. Um, so, for example, that uh, people don't leak information out of uh, in cam you know, if you, if you have an in camera uh, hearing, for example, of a committee and someone leaks the information, well, that compromises the effective working of the committee. Mm. So, the Privileges Committee investigates those sorts of breaches. Um, it consists of a majority of government senators, but the chair is always from the opposition. Um, it very rarely holds public hearings, it very rarely calls witnesses, it mostly deals on the papers, as they say. Okay. Um, it uh, is very much guided by the clerks. It, it has a great deal of um, reference to precedent and what's happened before. And in, ter in terms of the issue of it being bipartisan or non-partisan, I noticed that I think George Brandis is the chair of it, the Liberal Senator. Mm, that's right. Phil, can I ask you, do you think this is a political, a good political move by the Labor Party to go to a privileges on this issue of Utegate, or is it a dangerous political move for them? I think, it, I think it's probably a little dangerous, mainly because of the timing. Had it happened earlier, maybe there would have been some more political advantage in it. But I get the sense that the, the community is, is moving on from this issue in a way that Perhaps the politicians Are you getting the quite. sense that the community is moving on or that the Liberal Party desperately hopes that the community is moving <laughs> well, on? Well, I think there's no doubt the Liberal Party would like the community to move on for it. But uh, you know, just watching uh, Malcolm Turnbull on uh, Q&A a, mm. a couple of appearances ago, uh, it was quite clear from the audience reaction and the tenor of some of the questions being asked that, that people are interested in other issues like the ETS, like the education revolution, like what we need mm. to do in health. There's a whole range of issues that people are more interested in. And it's not like this issue hasn't been talked about and analysed to death and, to and covered in the media. I think people are at the point where they're ready to move on. So in that sense, it could be a little dangerous to keep prosecuting it. Bruce, what are your thoughts? Because I tend to agree with Phil. I do think that the public's ready to move on. I think there are political risks for the Labor Party in, in having this Privileges Committee looking like they're almost kicking a dog when it's down. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Well, I, I think it depends on what the C Privileges yeah. Committee does. In a, in a sense, I think politically it served its purpose. The Liberal Party voted against having an, an investigation into something that everybody thinks is a bit dodgy in the way that the, that Senate committee occurred. The pr committee, Privileges Committee itself may actually hold a nice discreet inquiry and come to some anodyne conclusion and, you know, everyone's satisfied. Um, as far as Utegate uh, is concerned, you know, there's still the Federal Police investigation. There, there are a few more kickers in this one. Um, I don't think that it has the immediate political potency anymore. Um, as I say, the, the, the Well, potentially quite the opposite. I mean, potentially this is the kind of thing that if the Labor Party tries to use it politically, if the public have moved on, it could leave them looking like they're just that little bit too nasty by heart. Yeah, I, I don't, so I don't think they'll necessarily use the Privileges Committee to prosecute it terribly aggressively. That, I, I'm not privy to their tactics, but that, that would be sort of my guess. And then all you need, all, the important thing as far as they're concerned, I think, is that the, the damage to Malcolm Turnbull's you know, reputation and his... Mm. The view of pe people's view of his judgment has been done. Um, if there's an occasional reminder of that, that serves a purpose. But I I'd be very surprised if there was a lot of mm. politics know, in it. Heat and mm. light still in this issue. Philip, mm. you're, um, you know, Malcolm Turnbull, there's been some suggestion that he may ha be asked to appear before mm. this Privileges Committee. Now, he's not required to appear. Uh, in fact, it would, I think, be the first time uh, that a person from the House has actually appeared at a Senate Privileges mm. Committee. Uh, politically, however, it might look bad for him if he is asked and refuses to appear. What do you think? Politically, should he go or, or should he observe, I guess, the precedent and, and not attend? Yeah, I think because of the precedent, he probably shouldn't. Um, and if this were, again, as I say, if it were happening at a different time and perhaps earlier during the heat of this, the p potential uh, looking bad of not going up to the Senate and appearing uh, might make him go. But given the way this is starting to fizzle out as an issue, I think he'll be more concerned about, and should be more concerned, about uh, maintaining the precedent that members of the House don't appear before these types of um, Senate institutions. And I don't think there would be a lot of political downside in him taking that position. Are you sure about that? I mean, do, do you agree, for example, Bruce, because I can see the Labor Party, if Malcolm Turnbull refuses to appear, as much as that might be within the precedent set with Senate privileges, I can see the Labor Party making an awful lot of that, that 
he's again not answering the tough questions that he's refused to answer publicly? I, I think you'll find that that's one of those things where they wouldn't push the point. I think they know full well, because you've got to remember that you know, there are swings and roundabouts in these things. You, mm. you know, when you, you're in opposition for a while or you don't, you know, you don't control the numbers for a while, um, and then uh, you know, next thing you know, you're in government and it goes around. And so nobody wants to sort of upset the apple cart on that. But you know, if, you, if you started down that track, what's to stop the government um, constantly calling um, senators before House of Representatives committees. Mm. Uh, there are, there are you know, dangerous things when you upset some of these balances. And uh, as someone who was um, threatened to be called before a Senate committee when <laughs> I was a staffer, and, and, and there was, again, there was a precedent that staffers, the ministers were answerable, staffers weren't. Um, and I said to the minister I worked for at the time, what happens um, if they call me? And he said, uh, well, you won't go. And I said, that'd be a contempt of the Senate. And his response was, we'll visit you in jail. Um, <laughs> Whatever think, it takes. <laughs> exactly. I think you'll find that, uh, you know, the politicians take a pretty hard line on this and they, they understand mm. the danger of going there. I, I don't think they'll push Malcolm. Well, there, there's certainly interesting issues that we're facing, whether it's the ETS or the Senate privileges, and we'll watch how they unfold in the next couple of months. Mm. You're watching The Contrarians. We have to go to a break right now. We'll be back in a moment. Yeah.